technical talk why not to come up with a, a small talk which gives you some perspective some idea and at the end of the day if you go with the some message i think that will be my achievement uh, of this interaction okay so this talk is all about the indian lizard and how a lizard which is considered as one of the unwanted elements in everybody's house in everybody's heart in the biodiversity is booming in real sense in indian scenario okay i'm just trying to uh, put forth some of the interesting findings and the journey of uh, indian lizards as such okay so i was told to you know talk on systematic evolution of indian lizards okay <laughs> because the moment i saw the, the poster I, I i was like thinking about it oh what what i what i what i what a subject they offered me so very very uh, interesting subject but i feel that i'm not the right person to do so because systematics is something which is, which which needs a tremendous uh, understanding of uh, many things for evolution we need to have another uh, uh, level of understanding again and for a person like me who spent his entire time looking at lizards under the microscope and in the field uh, uh, never had this opportunity to you know to reach to that level and to talk uh, authentically on systematics and evolution of indian lizards but let's see and then let's let's take that as a as a, as a rational uh, of this talk and let's take this talk further with that particular rational again so let's see what is systematics no it's is very in, in simple words if you look at what systematics is you know it is it is a study of diversification of living forms you know and uh, what are the what are the relationships among them you know which forms this entire thing i will make it more simpler now what systematics does is it provides scientific names to organ, organ organisms basically i'm just trying to make it more simpler now okay means people describe them they provide classification for the organisms and that classification is pure, uh, based on you no know, uh, very strong understanding you no know, proper understanding and uh, there is you no know, based on that they they provide the keys you know there is a good amount of data on, on its distribution interestingly there is some amount of inputs in the in the sector of evolutionary uh, uh, histories as well means people also look at dna phylogeny has been done so all those things are taken into consideration okay and apart from that to certain extent people are also looking at its ecology you know like what are the environmental adaptations and so and so forth so in general if you look at this particular field systematics encompasses everything it starts from looking at the organisms under the microscope to looking at the organisms in the nature what they are doing and then bringing all these things together you know in a perspective of dna and trying to understand how does these associations are happening it's it's a very it's a very tremendous thing it's very very amazing thing it's one of the and then look at the second part what is evolution you know so basically it's a it's a diversification you know from a, from a, from a, from a main trunk and there are branches which are happening so in simple words i'm trying to say what does that mean it is action which is mainly governed by natural selection genetic mutation drift hybridization so everything is 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 helping these animals to diverse you know to change to become something else you no know, things like that so so this is what is evolution so i i just trying to i'm just trying to make it more simpler that you know uh, uh, systematics is what and evolution is what so this is just a very broad uh, thing let's see what is common in both of them what is common in systematics and what is common in evolution what is constant basically and that is change if you look at systematics that is also changing like tremendous change is happening in that because we started at one point of time we started with looking at 
the morphological characters looking at i think predominantly colors then their their, their structure shape size everything and then dna came into existence Miss, uh, DNA studies came into existence. We started using DNA, then phylo, uh, their, their phylogenetic associations and everything. So, so if you look at this, that, 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 that thing is quite dynamic. It's, it is changing. And evolution is also the same. Evolution is not constant. It is changing. It is dynamic. So in both the things, the constant thing is a change. Now, if you ask me, I, 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 make, I make it very clear in the beginning that I'm not a good person to talk about evolution and systematics, as I told you. So my understanding of phylogeny is quite primitive. So I can read the trees, I can interpret the trees, but I don't know how the trees are formed. Means I can tell you that this is a mango tree, but how does that tree grew here? I don't know. It's like that. So that is my uh, uh, understanding in phylogenetics and evolution. I really really don't know much so i just make it very clear then you must be thinking like why i'm here why i'm going to what i what i'm going to do for the next 40 minutes now so let's see what i'm going to do interestingly if you look at the history of indian herpetology you no know, that is also changing there is a change there is a constant change, there is a positive change, there is a dynamic change which is happening in the field of Indian herpetology. And for the last two decades, I am also a minuscule, a small part of that change. So I'm part of that change. And here today, I'm go going to share my experience with you people based on the understanding I, I got by being part of this change. I hope you are getting me now what I mean uh, by, by this. That is very simple. I'm going to talk about systematics and evolution of the studies associated with Indian lizards. I'm not talking about evolution of lizards or I'm not talking about systematics of lizards. I'm talking about how systematically that study is happening. What are the evolutionary processes which are happening in that study? And at the end of the day, how that is going to benefit all of us. That is what is the idea of this entire talk. Okay. Let's start with the basics. Although this talk is about lizards, so let's talk about what are lizards. Okay. We know that lizards are reptiles. Reptiles are one of the highly neglected group of vertebrates. Although it is India or abroad, wherever you go, I don't feel that reptiles carry the attention they needed. Now, why should they be? Why should they be? You know, uh, uh, why we need to think about them? Why we need to worry about them? Let's have a little bit of discussion on that. Uh, excuse me, sir. Sorry to interrupt. I think somebody else has taken your screen. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think somebody with name Poonam. Yeah, please avoid sharing your screen. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, now Dr. Varad, you need to share it again. All the participants, please avoid all these things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah. No problem. So. Uh... There are about 8,000 species of, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, give me one minute. Give me one minute. Sorry. Yeah. Is the presentation visible? Yeah, it's visible now. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So there are about eight thousand species of uh, reptiles in the world, and about seven hundred 
different species of reptiles in India. Okay. Sorry, there is a spelling mistake on this. Okay. So, such a tremendous diversity. And this is, I'm talking about this is the diversity in their numbers. Okay. Imagine India. India is such a small country. Geographically, it is very small landscape. But it holds around 700 known species of reptiles. Now, this is something cool about, about this particular group. It's, 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 it's tremendous. It has diversity in their numbers. Okay. Now, let's look at why that diversity is there. Okay, now think of, you know, although they are so common, they are so rich, unfortunately, they are neglected. Now, why they are neglected? They are neglected because of the stories. We all know that lizards are poisonous. If they fall in your food, you get food poisoning. That is what we know. But that is not true. No? And all these unwanted elements are forcing us no, to have some distance from this uh, enigmatic group. We are, we are keeping a very safe distance from this enigmatic group because of that. Many times people say that, oh, they are not very beautiful. The problem is, the beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. Means, the problem is with me, not with the animals. Unfortunately, all these issues pertaining to reptiles are rooted in the information which is wrong. Much of the information we have about these particular animals, this particular group, are in the form of files which are corrupted, files which are unwanted in your hard disk. I think this is the high time. We need to delete those files, shift, delete those files, replace those files with the real things. The moment you do that, your perception towards this particular group will change. And I'm trying my best you know, to, to discuss about why they're important in this particular talk again. Okay, let's see where they're distributed. We look at their distribution. It's again very interesting. They're pan-tropical in distribution. Like they are uh, much more concentrated in tropics. And as we move away from the tropics, I think their distribution goes down naturally. Because these are the cold blooded animals, and uh, no, uh, tropics provides them ample opportunities for their diversification and, 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 and so many things. Whatever they need is quite uh, amply available in this particular place, so they are quite uh, uh, well distributed here. Now, where do we see reptiles? Why I'm asking these questions? Because these questions have quite a lot of things which are going to help us in many ways. When I ask you, where do you get a particular species? What does that mean? I'm trying to get information about its habitat. Why I need to have the information about the habitat? Because at the end of the day, if I want to do conservation of anything, I need to know their habitats. Without that, it is, is it possible for us to, you know, uh, to conserve anything? No, it is not. No, one of the basic requirements for conservation is their habitats. Now, if I ask you, where do you see reptiles? I think they are everywhere. There are burrowing reptiles, there are terrestrial reptiles, there are arboreal reptiles, there are aquatic reptiles. That means that they are literally everywhere. They have interesting breeding strategies. They have interesting you know, strategies to combat the temperature. Like during the low temperature, if the temperature is really very low, they hibernate. If the temperature is very high, they are estuate. There are many species which give birth to the animals. There are many species which lay eggs. They have a, that's all. They have tremendous strategies to live comfortably in these varied habitats. Now, I told you that they, are, they live in varied habitats. It means if I want to conserve reptiles, I need to take care of all these habitats. I need to conserve the land. I need to conserve the forest. I need to conserve the grasslands. I need to conserve everything, technically everything. And if in doing that, I'm also conserving tigers. Interestingly, it has always been told to us that if you conserve tiger, if you protect tiger, you are conserving 
everything because tiger is umbrella species we are protecting everything we are conserving everything let's play that game in a different way let's protect the foundation and what is the foundation reptiles amphibians insects arthropods you not know, all in invertebrates basically they are the foundations if if they do well i think tigers will ultimately do well so everything is thus quite interconnected it is kind of you no know, intricately associated so for the conservation of tiger the well being of reptile is also equally important if you want to see elephants do well in any habitat i think we need to be worried about reptiles in that habitat as well if reptiles do well and when will reptiles do well when the habitat is in intact okay like that so i think once you protect reptiles you are conserving tiger cells well. this is my my analogy correct me if i'm wrong now what do they eat they have a varied diet so the predominantly they feed on insects no and from invertebrates to small mammals or mammals to that matter like uh, python feed on uh, deer no from from which from from um, uh, small uh, invertebrates to the deer this is what is the range of their food now why i'm asking this to you why i'm telling this to you again because for conservation i need to be worried about their food as well so one of the two important aspects which are essential for conservation of any species one is their habitat and second is their food means when you are protecting reptiles we have to protect varied biodiversity as well means we have to protect insects we have to protect spiders we have to protect everything to that matter look at this now so this is something really cool no so their presence is going to help us in many ways in this way they are by protecting uh, by, by 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 feeding on the insect they are the best biological pest control agents so so this is what is that is their biological role now we saw that they live everywhere you know they are from from burrowing to arboreal forms they have varied diet means we started with their number we said that there are some 8000 species of reptiles in the world then we talked about their habitats and there is a tremendous diversity in their habitat as well then we looked at their feeding strategies there is a diversity in their feeding strategies as, as well think of their behavior behavioral strategies there is a diversity think of their breeding there is a diversity you know think of their activity pattern there is a diversity I mean, there are some some, some uh, reptiles that are active during the day some reptiles that are active during the night means what level of diversity we get in reptiles there is a tremendous diversity in every aspect of their life look at this photograph and then this photograph will tell you or this photograph is the answer for all the questions uh, we raised earlier where do they live they live in varied habitats how do they live there they have different body patterns body forms these different body forms help them to live in those different habitats uh, uh, a lizard or a snake or a reptile with cylindrical body no limbs is burrowing a reptile with flattened body strong hands and legs no uh, uh, laterally compressed body is arboreal like that no all these this diversity is needed to perform the acts we mentioned earlier all the colors here are responsible for all those activities all the shape of the eye is responsible for that for all see what do you see what your diversity you see here is because of the way they live because of what they eat because of where do they live so this is something really cool no so they are quite dynamic in many ways because of these these reasons. now how does that going to help us let's look at that uh, aspect as well now let's talk about indian lizards so i think i with this i managed to give you a 
brief background about reptiles and why they are important, what is happening to them and blah, blah, blah. Now, let's talk about Indian lizards. Believe me, Indian lizards are also equally cool. They are so stunning. They are amazing. So whenever we talk about reptiles in India, everybody gets fascinated by snakes. And in snakes, everyone gets fascinated by king cobra. If you ask me, I will say that king cobra is okay. It's just a big snake. There are so many other snakes. There are so, so many other reptiles. In that, we have lizards as well. And they are also equally cool. Okay, let's see why and how they are cool. Why Indian lizards are cool? Let's look at that question now. I told you that there are quite a lot of species of lizards in India, something around 700 species of lizards in India. Okay, now for such a small landscape, why such a tremendous diversity? Why such a huge diversity? 700 is not a small amount, small number. And believe me, this number is not the real number. There are many species which are not known to science. People are still describing them. I'm coming to that aspect as well. So what we know is around 700 species. For such a small landscape, 700 species is a big number. Why? Let's ask that question. So I, I, I'm not going into the first, all details about biogeography. I'm just trying to brief you that you know, the events which happened in the past govern the biodiversity. What biodiversity we see, see today is the result of all the events which happened in the past. It means starting from 4.5 billion years ago when Earth started. You know, all those events are responsible for whatever biodiversity we have today. So I'm just trying to you know, brief you about one of the few major events. You know? So one of them is, uh, you know, so you, we know that India was part of Africa at one point of time. And it, when, when it got separated from uh, uh, Africa, it started moving up. And this entire landmass was wet ever green forest. I'm not going to those details. But this is something which is really, very really important. There's one big event called Deccan Trap Volcanism. That event has changed quite a lot of you know, things in India. Then if you think of India, and if you think of the diversity here, this diversity is quite, quite interesting. If you go to the northeastern part of India, you get Indo-Chinese elements. Go to the northwestern part of India, you get Middle Eastern elements. There are quite a lot of endemic diversity in peninsular India. And there are many species which are in India which has affinities with uh, Sri Lanka. No? And uh, so why? Why? Why so? No? So there are many theories which say that no? uh, uh, why such a tremendous diversity. But we know that at one point of time, India got attached to Asia. And then all the faunal exchanges and everything happened. So what? how does that result? In? That resulted in this particular thing. A wet evergreen forest got converted into 10 different biogeographic zones. India is not one unit. Biogeographically, there are 10 different units. What does that mean? That means there are places where you get a unique diversity. And in all these places, you will surely, you surely get unique diversity. And when it comes to lizards today, I think all these representative the biogeographic zones has some endemic uh, uh, lizard diversity that or a diversity which is confined to that kind of uh, biogeographic zone so this is cool no so these biogeographic zones are a derivative of all the you know, events what we discussed and they have uh, uh, interesting uh, floral diversity there the ecological conditions are different and all these things shape the biodiversity there and all these things share the lizard diversity there. If you go to arid landscape, you get a different diversity. If you come to the Western Ghats, you get very strong endemic diversity. If you go to islands, there is a there is a big endemic diversity in the islands as well. If you go to the northeastern part of India, there is a rich diversity of reptiles, but they are mainly Indo-Chinese elements are popping in there. So, so, so every place is filled with lizards. Every place is filled with reptiles. So, so this is cool about India. India, that's why I'm saying that India is not one unit. India has 10 different things. And all these things hold a different diversity. Now, again, I'm going back to the earlier discussion. Where do they live? How do they live? That is very important. No? Like Now, these 10 different biogeographic zones has 10 different elements. 
the temperature is different humidity is different their altitudinal gradient is different everything is different and then these lizards have to cope up those conditions and they modify themselves to live there happily so this is something very very amazing about this landscape so this is like another level of diversity no so i, I we, we are we are not i think see whenever we talk about diversity we talk about numbers we say that there are 1400 birds 1400 is just the species level diversity that that tells you that these many species are there but is that the only diversity no no look at the way they live look at the food they eat look at so look at the kind of the food they eat and to do all those things they have to have some different body features they have to have some different genetic structure they have to have some different evolutionary trajectory evolutionary history no so all these things and that's how it becomes more interesting the diversity increases in many folds that's how india is rich not only in biodiversity but in varieties of diversities like this okay. so there are about 700 more than 700 species of reptiles in india and out of that 285 species are of lizards no? so it's a, it's, a, it's really a big number believe me 285 is is still a underestimated figure i feel that around 400 to 450 species of lizards are there in india means another 40 to 50% diversity of lizards is not known to science And correct me if i'm wrong i think uh, one day once you start you no know, once we start looking at uh, uh, these things in different biogeographic zones i think we will come up with these things okay now interestingly the diversity is mainly concentrated in the western ghats and northeastern part of india the present known diversity let me clarify it. the presently known diversity is concentrated in the western ghats and northeastern part of india is it true is western ghats a hotspot for lizard diversity no i will i'll tell you afterwards <laughs> okay so with the new insights with the new surveys with new people you know venturing into india in different different biogeographic zones in india our understanding of reptiles is changing our understanding of lizards is changing and believe me that's what i said in the beginning that it is from it is it is booming now okay so at present what we know is a diversity which is endemic to the western ghats and northeastern part of india or because there are many people who went there and did the study there are many other landscapes there which are not been explored and probably once you go there things will change i think more than 60% species are endemic to what this geographical landscape called india imagine if something happens there this diversity is going to go means they are here because of multiple reasons they are here they are exclusively here because of those reasons means it becomes our prime responsibility to take care of them because we are part of the biodiversity we need biodiversity without lizards we can't survive without snakes we can't survive snakes will survive without us lizards will survive without us but we will not survive without them and imagine like 60% diversity which is endemic that is supporting our survival we need to take them to that level now now the ministry is getting added i think things will change so now let's see how how does this particular thing evolve now i am say what what i uh, in the beginning i said that so let's talk about systematics and evolution let's see how this field has changed how this field is evolving okay so from 1758 to 1947 this is i'm calling this as a pre pre independence era this is only for our understanding okay so i'm putting this era only for our understanding okay why 1758 because that was the time when 
Carl Linnae published his first thing, and he's come, he started the uh, systematic taxonomy. Basically, he's the father of taxonomy. So he started properly describing species with proper scientific name, which is still being followed. Still, we are following the same Linnaean taxonomy. Okay, so that's why I'm putting 1750. So from 1750 to 1947. So much of the diversity we know was described during this period. So let's see. I think I'm going to give you some figures as well afterwards. No. So interestingly, much of these descriptions are quite short. No, it's like one paragraph description, a description mostly based on coloration, a description mostly based on uh, uh, primi pri pri few primitive characters, like that. So it was, it was like that. So it was vague description, and uh, interestingly, many of the species has a vague locality data. The locality said India or Malabar. Now. When we are talking about cryptic diversity, when we are talking about endemic diversity, there are many species which are point endemic. There are many species which are known from very small geographical area. And in that sense, if you if if, if somebody tells me that this particular species is endemic to India, very difficult because India is not one unit. India is ten different biogeographic zones now. You need to remember that. And in that sense, I think you no. Know, this kind of uh, uh, locality data is really bad. Now, why we need to worry, worry about locality data? Locality data gives us the distribution, gives us the range of that particular species, and that becomes the foundation for their conversation. IUCN requires that kind of information, and based on that, we come up with the uh, IUCN criteria. Interestingly, do we really have a good amount of data about the distribution for reptiles in India. Let's see at the end of this presentation what we have. Much of these descriptions were by non-professionals. Why I'm calling non-professional now? So non-professional technically it should be in the inverted commas. Non-professional means professional person like me now. It is my job. I have been paid to do that work. I have been trained to do to, do, to that kind of work. So I'm not, I'm not non-professional. I'm technically a professional. But there are many people. No, wait a minute. There are many people who are amateur naturalists. And they are contributing, contributing towards science. But we are calling them amateur naturalists because they don't have a typical scientific degree with them. But their understanding of biodiversity is phenomenal, tremendous. So one of the best amateur naturalists, uh, to my knowledge, is Dr. Salim Ali. Look at his contribution. The amount of contributions that person has done. There are people who are doing PhD on the work he has done. I always feel that you know, amateurs contribute more than the professionals because professionals have goals. Their goals are in the form of publications. They need to publish papers. They need to get you know, the, these many papers, this much are increment. These many papers, I will, I will go to this conference, like that. So the professionals have certain goals. But amateurs do that for the betterment of science. This is again my analogy. Okay, Correct me if I'm wrong again. So much of the descriptions in this particular period were, were made by army officers, doctors, and mostly by Europeans. Very few Indians who uh, were active in this particular phase. Then, the second phase is from 1947 to 2000. This particular phase also dominated by anecdotal new species descriptions. What I mean by anecdotal, anecdotal is people did not make efforts to document the diversity. What does that mean? That means, imagine you people invited me to come to Pondicherry University to give a talk. Okay, so I gave a talk. So I had one day spare. What I did, I went on. I started looking at the forest nearby. I went on a beach and there I saw a lizard. That's all. That lizard was very interesting. I managed to catch a few individuals and then I described them. 
means i went for something else and did something else so that's what i'm saying anecdotal okay so there was no dedicated effort made to go out and look for lizards okay and interestingly many bad descriptions happened during that period of time the science is very important to do good science good appreciation comes appreciation comes to you to do bad science the blame goes to the country if you do good science people appreciate you people say oh this person is doing good science but when you some when somebody does bad science the same people blame the country they say that oh indians don't do good science so my humble request to everyone if you are publishing something publish properly publish in a good journal a journal where good review happens don't publish papers for the better uh, for for your personal glory publish papers for the betterment of science that is going to last longer okay now if you publish something wrong it it remains but let's forget about the bad things think about uh, good things as well there are some amazing good descriptions as well like person like uh, indranil das you no know, he laid a strong foundation for quite a lot of uh, new species descriptions his descriptions are so robust that people like us used to read those and then understand you no know, uh, taxonomy uh, in 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 better way and we use his papers as foundation to you no know, publish new species again in future and then i call this as a modern era it started in 2000 why i'm calling this as modern era because this is the time when people started using big robust new species description these people started looking at multiple characters people started using good microscopes to extract the information about morphology and do it do a proper description then this was the time when intensive sampling came to existence what i what i mean by intensive sampling means people went out to different localities with one goal if person like ishan agarwal who did his phd on three different genera of geckos he traveled across india only looking at those three different genera vidipak studied the panthrodet lizard he traveled across india to study panthrodet lizard anirudh dattara studied skinks and he studied across he he traveled across india to study skinks now akshay khandekar is looking at geckos he is visiting many places to look at chaitanya ar chaitanya he is also looking at lizards okay and he also traveling a lot so what i mean by this now that now people have goals people have targets and they are working on these goals and targets for many many years now. go to northeastern part of india much of the understanding of our uh, 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 herpetofauna diversity from the landscape is by uh, uh, many many people are there there are people uh, uh, in guwahati there are people in uh, mizoram university there are people abhijit das is one of the prominent figures there you know jayaditya purakayasta is there sg lalren sangha is there so all these people are helping us you know to enrich our understanding about uh, the reptile diversity and all these people are working there for last 10 to 20 years now that's what is very interesting in the beginning as i told you many people who discovered those species they were not indians they came here they did the work they really did amazing work tremendous work which is still the foundation for us no and then they went but today there are people who are studying reptiles they are studying reptile for last 20 years this is really good this is the time when people uh, started phylogeny and biogeography one of the prominent labs is the lab of dr pravin karant of indian institute of science and quite a lot of papers you no know, pertaining to the uh, phylogeny and biogeography they published from this lab i think this lab has changed our entire understanding of reptiles in india especially the lizards in india now look at what the potentials we have when it comes to lizards in india now no so i'm just trying to tell you that these are the different things i i i think you, you got the idea now what is happening how it is happening and it started with taxonomy in the beginning only taxonomy anecdotal like very short descriptions then it slowly evolved into detailed descriptions in the nilda's example then it again got evolved into intensive surveys 
detailed descriptions and phylogeny biogeography everything now so the science is getting integrated the taxonomy systematics is getting integrated so people are not answering the question merely by looking at morphology they are also looking at dna they are also looking at their evolutionary trajectory they are also look, looking at their biogeography no they are trying to put in all the lines of evidences to prove what they are saying and i feel that that is the real approach that is the proper approach that is the integrated approach no? so today you may be no you may be quite shocked to see that oh so many people are describing so many new species describing a new species of reptile in india is not not big deal because as i told you 30 to 40% diversity is not at known to science this there is a like one uh, i think no you have tremendous opportunity to describe new species so 30% diversity is not known to science but if you want to describe something we need to follow this integrated approach and how to do that i think there are many papers that are published now and we have to you know, work accordingly interestingly look let's look at the potential what are the different potential no one of them is decoding cryptic diversity and to do that we need to follow the integrated approach i will, I will brief you about what does that mean no now we should be very cautious about this particular aspect no many times we say oh this is a widely distributed species but is it really a widely distributed species we need to check that as well and believe me that is not right there are many species which we described were considered as widely distributed in the past and they turned out to be new species so this widely distributed thing should be taken with pinch of salt because india is not one country india has 10 different biogeographic zones india has seen quite a lot of changes what we uh, what we saw in the beginning so how can you expect the same species occur everywhere no difficult now there are many species which are not from science and we have to look at that there is a potential in describing those species as well suppose if i ask you how can you become immortal is there any way to become to gain the immortality yes there is one way describe a new species the moment you describe a new species your name gets associated with that species until science is alive you remain immortal your name remain immortal and if you really want to be immortal herpetology is the science in india which gives you that immortality because again 30% diversity is not known to science you describe one species okay after you become immortal interestingly what we have to do now we have to do intensive explorations in other zones as well eastern ghats is one of the tremendous place where the diversity is not at explore little bit work which ishan and akshay started uh, in recent years has you know uh, changed our understanding of lizards people sometimes ask like what is the hot spot for lizards in india believe me it is not western ghats it is arid zone it's probably the eastern ghats which has more diversity of lizards than the western ghats So this is how our understanding has changed. Now, let's see what are the potentials in taxonomy, phylogeny, system, blah blah blah. Okay. So when I say decoding cryptic diversity, what does that mean? Cryptic diversity is a diversity which is, you know, they visibly look alike. If you follow morphology, if you follow taxonomy, it is difficult to say that these two are distinct species. But genetically. and evolutionarily they are distinct they are different but morphologically they look alike there is something called morphological plasticity that doesn't the, the morphology never change they remain as it is but genetically they are not at all related they look quite distinct different okay now in that situation we need to follow integrated taxon taxonomy we need to do a detailed morphology and we also need to do a intensive phylogenetics and for decoding cryptic diversity this is something which we need to So this is one example where Ishan Agarwal. No, so this is a lizard uh, of the genus called Cetropodium. Okay, and this lizard is uh, uh, 
uh, known from uh, arid zones in um, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, uh, some parts of uh, you know, Chhattisgarh like that. And these lizards now are known by around three or four species in India, but it is much more than that. And that's what Ishan study proved. It. Okay, now we looked at its morphology. Believe me, morphologically, these all populations look alike. There is not much change in their morphology. Why it is so? I think they all are under same selection pressure. That same selection pressure is not you know, allowing them to change. They are remaining as it is, but there is no gene flow happening between two different populations, and they are now quite distinct today. <clears throat> so, how to address these issues? Again, for that, we need to have an integrated approach. Now, this is one example of something called widely distributed species. There is a species called Hematoclus brookia. You all know that. So, this particular species was known from every nook and corner of India. It was everywhere. So, under that species, there were so many synonyms. So, Stephen Mahoney published a paper, and that paper was purely based on morphology. He looked at morphological characters, and he realized that they are morphologically very distinct. Whatever the species called synonyms, they are morphologically distinct. And he said, yes, they are morphologically distinct species. Later, Aparna from Praveen Karan's lab, as part of her PhD, she published this paper where she proved that what Stephen Mahoney is saying is not wrong. And there are many species in that complex which are not known to science. Means a species which is considered as one is technically composed of maybe 15, 20 species or more than that. Imagine we were doing injustice to around 20 endemic lineages, 20 evolutionarily distinct lineages of lizards in India. They were wrongly identified. They were called as something which is widely distributed, which is wrong. Henceforth, whenever you are describing, whenever you are identifying something, be very, very serious. Be very, very cautious. No? Because your wrong identification is going to change the distribution of that particular species. The distribution is going to hamper its conservation strategies. So the IUCN is going to use that data. This is about unknown diversity. This is a paper published by uh, R. Chaitanya again. So he explored the southern Western Ghats and some parts of uh, uh, north and south of Palghat Gap. Okay, and he got all these all these different species there. So all of them were called as Dravidogecko anomalensis. Again, what Chaitanya did? He did intensive sampling. He went to all those localities, all the localities from where these uh, lizards are known. He went there and he collected samples with due collect permits. Then he did a serious phylogeny. He did a serious morphology. And all these things put together, he published this paper as a lead author. And he described around five new species. Means uh, uh, six new species. So interestingly, we were doing injustice to all these genetically or evolutionarily independent lineages, distinct lineages, which are endemic to India. And we are doing injustice to them, calling them, or misidentifying them. This is something cool, no? There is tremendous un un unknown diversity in India like this. Who is going to explore that? We have to do that. Now, what do we mean by integ integrated approach? That means, we have to look at phylogenetics, use proper genes. I don't know because I don't know which genes to be used and everything, but I, I feel that uh, a proper phylogeny needs to be done. Then look at their behavior as well. So that behavior, if, if, if this species is doing some display, if, if, if it is uh, under natural selection, that is something cool again. No? So that is uh, like Sitana, the study of panthered lizard. Uh, where all these things were taken into consideration. Look at their musculature, look at their bones, look at their hemipenis, look at do proper morphology and do proper phylogenetics and bring these two, two things together and then go ahead and publish your work. 
then your paper becomes really robust. Because today, describing a new species is not a, is not a problem. You will describe a new species, but that species description should be proper. That species description should not be wrong. If somebody is reading your description, he or she should not blame India for doing bad science. That's what is my request. Now, this is just a brief glimpse of you know, how and when these new species descriptions are happening. So I think by looking at this chart, you will realize that you know, year 2000 or this particular time is quite, quite important. No? So look at this now. In 1700, because uh, it, it started in 1758, so only th uh, six pieces of lizards were described. In 1800, 139 out of 283, 139 pieces were described. I don't know what happened. In 1900, I think not much work has been done. In reptiles and in lizards as well. But again, you see that big boom. In 20 years, Nearly 20 years, 130 new species of reptiles and 100 new species of lizards have been described from India. Means what we know today, out of that, the 100 species are described in the last 20 years. And probably much more than that is yet to be described. So this is something very, really very cool. So this is what is happening. We are still unearthing the diversity which is not known to science. We are still disclosing the diversity which is which which we don't know. That graph is still going up, and when that will reach epitome, God knows. But there is, I, I always feel there is quite a lot of diversity is not known to science now. We, we looked at various aspects now. So we looked at uh, you know, uh, uh, cryptic diversity, we looked at phylogenetics. Now, look at unexplored landscapes as well. Ishan Agarwal and Akshay Khandekar, they joined together. Now they are working with Thackeray Foundation, uh, Thackeray Wildlife Foundation. And from through under that ages, they are, they are doing tremendous work in, in Eastern Ghats. And they described quite a lot of new species. No, like the, out of that 100, many of the species are described by this team. So this is something cool. And they are concentrating their efforts in Eastern Ghats. A landscape which has not been considered as biodiversity rich, but is much, much richer when it comes. No? So our understanding is changing. Apart from that, See now, why there is evolution? Because there is a need. That is the process. Like a particular species want to change, want to evolve. If it doesn't change with the surrounding, it goes extinct. Similarly, science has to grow. Science has to flourish. Science has to evolve. And in reptiles, that is happening. In lizards, that is happening. We saw that in the beginning. Very vague descriptions. Then bit detailed descriptions. Then phylogeny. Then systematics. And then findings like this. So Ishan has published quite a lot of papers in this particular uh, in this particular aspect. And this is one of the papers where he talks about you know, how is the diversification of a genus Cetodactylus which is happening in India. No? And is it, it is something to do with the biogeography of Himalayas. How Himalayas shaped the diversity of a genus Cerodactylus in, in that particular landscape. And then this is a time, uh, time tree where he looked at when and what events are responsible for uh, that kind of diversification. No? Like DNA is not only used to see if the species are distinct or not. But it, he went a step ahead. And he's trying to correlate the diversification of those lizards with the events which happened at that particular point of time. It's why such a tremendous diversity because of all these events. And he's trying to prove that by using lizards as a model. 
This is one genus. Let's see how many genera are there and what can be done with those. This is another tremendous paper uh, Ishan and uh, Takuma Ramakrishnan published from NCBS. No? So how the grasslands shaped the diversification of a group of lizards called Lacertes. There's a, a family of lizards called Lacertidae. No? And there's quite a lot of diversity of these uh, 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 tiny terrestrial lizards. These lizards are on the ground. No? And uh, they're quite, quite common in arid landscape. No? So this grassland, they are mainly associated with grasslands. And the expansion of grassland was responsible for the diversification of these lizards. We know that, no, that wet evergreen forests slowly disappeared and many uh, places got covered with grasslands. And when that was happening, these lizards started diversifying. No? So we know that there is a tremendous diversity. We know that they are rich in like diversity is there, but why? So this is one of the answers. It's how and why so many opisops, means so many lacerates are there in the in the grasslands. It is because of these events. Just, just look at this you know, So uh, studies like this change our perception towards every landscape, change our perceptions towards every species, because this revised understanding tells us that, oh, this particular species is here because of these, these, these reasons. And anything happens to that reason, that species is going to go. And if that species goes, the ecological balance of the landscape will go. Means that will be a problem for the people living there. So it is so simple. So it was all about systematics, phylogeny, blah, blah, blah. What about natural history? Are there any ecological studies which are happening? In the past, I think much of the studies on lizards were not on uh, natural history, but they were mostly uh, into their endocrinology, into you know, uh, uh, developmental biology, stuff like that. But natural history, very little. But thanks to many labs, there are two prominent labs, you know, uh, one led by Maria Tucker and another Kavita Ishwaran. Both these labs are there in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. These labs are predominantly using lizards as their study models. And they're asking some tremendous questions and getting very, very great results. Now, this is a paper which they published in Animal Behavior, one of the good journals, where they looked at the throat coloration, that fan coloration in, in this fan throated lizard. And how is that used for signaling? Which are the signals? Which are the colors you know, they are using to signal male and female? It's a very, very, very interesting paper. Very, 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 very good paper. And now, how many fanthrotted lizards are there in India? There are many. At one point of time, only one species. Pondicherry is the type locality for one of the oldest species of uh, fanthrotted lizard, that is Sitana pontisiriana. Okay, now there are many species of Sitana, fanthrotted lizards in India. And every species has its own gular structure, own throat, uh, fan structure. The coloration is different, their shape is different, their size is different. Because males have it. Males display that to attract the female. Hence, the females are getting attracted towards that male by looking at that particular. This is a sexual selection, basically. No? Means that fan is under natural selection, which that fan has tremendous data. Now, we know a bit about one or two species. There are many species for which this information is not known. Who is going to study that? You have to do that. This is another uh, nice paper, you know, which I wish to refer here is you know, coloration in lizards. We, we say that, oh, this lizard is brightly colored. This is, lizard is not brightly colored. But why do they have those bright colors? Why they don't have colors? Why they change the colors? No, if you start asking these questions, I think there are answers which will help you to publish some good papers. And these naturalist observations are needed for their conservation as well. Because they are doing those activities in a particular season. They are doing those activities in a, in a particular way. Means that thing is needed 
for their survival means i should have that understanding that understanding i am going to use it for their conservation so so this is how everything is interconnected basically and very important aspect is awareness are we really doing enough awareness when it comes to uh, when it com com comes to the uh, uh, lizards see now I, i i managed to tell you that what are the different aspects where you can contribute no start with systematics ecology evolution biogeography you you tell me give the options give the opportunities equally we have to do awareness i always say that science is incomplete until it is communicated if you may do amazing science you may do tremendous scientific work but if that is not getting converted into a good information which everybody a common person can understand that science is of no use so science has to reach to masses then your science is complete so are we doing enough towards the awareness of uh, of lizards i don't feel so why why i say this because look at the number of people who are working on lizards and look at number of people who are working on birds there is quite a lot of awareness in birds and there is not much awareness in lizards interestingly what is a bird evolutionarily bird is a reptile means it reptiles <laughs> one of the groups is highly studied and another group is not only because lack of awareness now this is what we are doing you know as see i am not raising the problems i am not saying that these are the problems but i am trying to tell you that you no know, this is what we are contributing to that particular sector so what are examples are given here although it is for biogeography maybe a phylogeny what are it maybe we were part of it so we were managed you know to look at those issues and try to address those problems now awareness is a problem for that what are we doing we are doing these courses during this lockdown i started announcing this online courses every saturday sunday we do this course two day course where uh, uh, we start with the understanding of lizards in general aspect of lizards are discussed there and uh, another course which is on taxonomy no so i did similar course for snakes i did similar course for frogs similar courses on lizards as well so this is what is happening because without awareness we will not go we will not get more people and why we need that awareness why we need more people do you feel that it is enough now because there are some uh, 600 or 700 species of lizards uh, reptiles in india okay let's leave it with that no? why we need more people we need more people because there is too much work to be done look at these figures now how many genera how many species in that genera and how many species are studied properly studied when i say studied for which i have some information about the natural history i have some information about the distribution i have some information about the breeding everything and out of all these things i think hardly four species or maybe five or six species of lizards for which we have that information the rest all species we don't know anything we only know that there are so many species and so many genera one species lives there one species lives there that's what that that's all But that is not information when do they breed i don't know what do they eat i don't know is there any seasonality i don't know so all that information is not known to science what does that mean that means you have tremendous potential to answer all these questions now why to answer these questions is again i will go back to the same thing i need to have this knowledge because with this knowledge i am going to conserve these animals why to conserve these animals because if they are there the survival of humans is assured 
without them our survival is of no use so i'm i'm i'm, I'm i may be sounding a bit philosophical but guys believe me this is the fact at one point of time let's accept the fact let's say that we are responsible for the problems let's say that without these animals we will not survive and the moment you say that i think our attitude our uh, respect for these animals will change no i told you no what can you do with these animals no if you if you do phylogeny you do biogeography you natural history natural history is something which is which is a dying science like taxonomy is a fundamental science it is dying it is critically endangered natural history is also dying tell me how many people really go to the field and observe animals in the field nothing but we have to come out of that now so whoever is listening to this talk whatever education background you have worry for don't worry, don't forget about it. don't worry about it you can contribute in any way to the, to, to this field because what we need is a genuine interest what we need is a dedicated effort before i forget let me give you one example r chaitanya was a it professional until 2014 and in 2020 he has around 20 species to his credit he described around 20 more species akshay khandekar is a small he is a student post graduated before few years and he published i think more than 40 50 new species now so what what i mean that now if you wish you can contribute okay you are not interested in taxonomy you want to do something like natural history look at this look at the 0000 i think all natural history information is needed for all these animals no distribution nothing is known we know randomly that these, these things are here see what you do with your photographs we upload them on the facebook but do we upload them on any citizen science website citizen science portals like i naturalist or india biodiversity portal we don't do that because i don't get likes there the guys that is going to help in conservation not your photograph uploaded on facebook where you get likes that is okay that gives you a little bit of self satisfaction that's all that is not going to help in conservation in any way but your photograph uploaded on these websites are important how are we going to enrich our understanding about lizards how are we going to you know fill these gaps how are, when are you going to change these numbers for that we need more people for that we need many more people when we add more people many more species will get this described and many more new avenues will get open for you think about this this is something really very really important i told you that number and everything okay do you feel that are we doing justice to indian lizards indian lizards more than 60% diversity is endemic to india they have tremendous diversity in their shape they have tremendous diversity in their coloration they have tremendous diversity in their habitat preference their breeding strategies everything all this diversity is there but uh, it is unexplored we really don't know we only say that oh india is rich but india is equally poor in all these aspects as well if it comes to conservation i don't have anything in my hand i don't know how to conserve this lizard and what is fun in saying that we are rich we are uh, part of a country which is rich in biodiversity we have taken our biodiversity for granted we have not done much justice to indian lizards now on we have to do that what is needed what is needed is a revised attitude of everyone towards lizards lizards are not dangerous they are not problematic okay we need them because that knowledge is going to help us in their conservation in true sense in our conservation okay we basically what is needed is we have to you know uh, uh, get rid of all these things and start looking at lizards in a revised way look at the distribution although it is a common lizard you no know, just look at its distribution write about it upload the observations you no know, slowly try to enhance our understanding towards lizards any aspect 
anything you can control it now the question is who will bring this change i give you the examples of people who really brought the change I, as i told you no like i was part of that change that's why i am trying to speak uh, i'm speaking like this okay now is this change is enough did we really change a lot no nothing we haven't changed anything it's a small minuscule things are happening we're slowly heading towards it but if more people join in i think there will be a proper change and who are those more people everyone this is a right given by our constitution constitution of india has given us a right to enhance the knowledge about biodiversity so every citizen of india is has he has or she has to do this job no whatever your education background is forget about it you can contribute okay before i conclude i would like to say that this is the golden era for indian lizards and studies on indian lizards in india because as i told you it is evolving it is metamorphosing it is changing it is shedding its skin it is getting a new skin trying to grow old big and that change is in that that is happening in multiple ways like there are ecological studies happening there are you know biogeography every all the studies are happening and you can contribute to this interestingly think beyond the box unfortunately what we do we repeat the work done by somebody else what we do we we do something which people have done in the past let's break that thing now let's break that uh, uh, monotonous thinking just come out of it and start you know think beyond the box because in indian lizards there are so many questions which you can ask interestingly if you are asking questions your answer should be based on you know, integrated approach the priority should be given to the integrated approach first you have to be sure about what species you are talking you have to sure about the identity of that species then take your science further then start collecting the data associated data for the ecology and everything before that don't do it you may be wrong after few days you will oh this is a wrong species this is some some other species then all your science is of no use for that what you need to do is start from the base start from the root interestingly there was dr uh, uh, yes bhupati from sakon he was one of the best persons who studied community ecology when it comes to uh, reptiles in india and he had, he met with an accident in his no more unfortunately and after that that science is gone that field is dead in india community ecology is something really cool now think of indian lizards in the perspective of diversity which i had told you and think of community ecology there i think this is one of the best study models when it comes to community ecology no? above all get mesmerized by them because see we hate lizards because of the unwanted uh, elements all all those corrupted flies remove all those flies you know get some good information and get mesmerized by them believe me will become immortal one day uh, i'm thankful to uh, anuj shinde my my very good friend who provided me with the checklist and ishan for images again uh, i'm thankful to many people who contacted me and uh, ecology and environmental division of pondicherry university for this opportunity uh, thank you all thank you very much this is my email id and these are my phone numbers if you want you can contact me any time uh, i'll be more than happy to extend my support except the financial stuff support in this support <laughs> pertaining to uh, lizards i'll be more than happy to extend thank you very much thank you thank you varad sir Uh, now i i think my role is over i'll hand it over to indu to take it on from here right indu yes sir good uh thank you sir for providing uh, providing us with insights into the journey of the beautiful creatures that are indian lizards and explaining to us in the simplest way about their ecology systematics and evolution 
uh, a recording of this seminar will be uploaded later in the day on our YouTube channel. Now, I think we can go ahead to the question answer session. So would you like me to read out the questions for you? Yeah, I think that, you yeah that will be nice because then I may I may not be missing the, the question. OK, sir. Yeah. So the first question is from Venkatesh. Uh, sir, in, a sand, in sand dunes, these reptiles appear more interestingly with color change. If I want to study the population structure there, how can I proceed for the study? Please suggest us. So, as I told you in the beginning itself, that I am I'm not a, a, a very good person to talk about ecological studies or anything. Because I, I, I did uh, uh, taxonomy throughout my life. But there are people like, uh, yes, Hari Krishnan, who did quite a lot of uh, work on ecological aspects, on, uh, on deserts in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Ishan Agarwal did quite a lot of work on ecology of uh, lizards in desert landscape. So probably those are the people who will help you, you know, in designing these kind of studies. I'm not be a right person to uh, answer these questions. Uh, so the next question is from Poonam. What were the reasons that we, we are dependent on lizards? What is the reason we are dependent on lizards? I think uh, everything. No, lizards are integral part of the food chain. If lizards are not there, insect population will grow. When insects will grow, all the food will go. Okay, if lizards are not there, there are many species which are dependent on lizards will, will, will vanish. Means there will be a huge imbalance in the ecosystem. Means the ecosystem will not perform as it is performing now. And if the ecosystem is not performing, means where humans will survive. No, our entire survival is directly dependent on them like this. No, they are integral part of the biodiversity. See, uh, we always give the example of food chain. So in food chain, we say that there are insects and you know, the lizards feeding on insects. And there is a snake which feeds on, uh, on lizard. There is an eagle which feeds on snakes like that. And then we also say that if this is not there, then there will be a problem. Put ourselves in the food chain now. What is our role in the food chain? Think of us as part of the food chain and just say that if we are not there in the food chain, what will happen? I think nothing will happen. Food chain will come back to its normal. Okay, so the problem is you no, know, uh, uh, they don't need us and we need them because they are integral part of the food chain. They are integral part of the biodiversity, like us. Yeah. And the next question is, is from Sudipta. Hello, sir. I'm yeah. a student of Pondicherry University Ecology and EBS Department. I have observed after coming here to Pondicherry University that the common house gecko found here or the house lizard we are all familiar with is much more larger in size in comparison with the ones from my home state Assam. So my question is why they have this morphological difference and are they different subspecies? Sudipta, I think they are different species. Okay, Hibidaculus is a genus of a gecko of which very few species are human commensals. If you go to north, northern India, okay, there is one species called Hibidaculus flaviviridis. Okay, it's called northern house gecko. It's quite big. No, I think it is there in uh, your landscape as well. So in your place, there is another species called Hibidaculus aquilonius. Okay, so that is a different species. There's another species called Hemidaculus platurus. Okay, so that is again from Northeast. These two are common house geckos there. If you come to uh, southern India, there is a Hemidaculus flaviridis in few numbers, but it is replaced by another species called Hemidaculus frenatus. And that Hemidaculus frenatus itself is a complex. And there are many species in that brookie complex which are also part of the house geckos. Okay, so I think uh, you, you, the species what you see in your house native is a different species, and what you see here in Pondicherry is a different species. So uh, the next question is from Joanika, hmm. sir. I am working in Northeast India, though I am not working particularly on reptiles. I have come across many locals believing that lizards, in particular, be bengalensis and be salvator are therapeutic. 
they use their fats as massaging balms. Can you comment on this? <laughs> See, uh, I think uh, uh, for humans, no, there are there are any wild animal is therapeutic. There are two things. One is aphrodisia, and one is uh, uh, any any medicinal property. How does that help? Nobody knows. It doesn't work in any way. Okay, but we kill them for that reason, and that is not been proved. That is not been that is that is it is not been used in any orthopedic in sorry in, in, in any allopathic or any medicines. If at all that particular thing would have any value, I think humans must have extracted that. Human is one of the smartest race, smartest species. Okay, for their survival, they will do they will go to any extent. Okay, and if they know that you no, know, there is something uh, in these particular lizards, they would have got it out until now. No, nothing is true. All these local medicines are of no use. See, the problem is people want to kill them and eat them. And to do that, they they uh, use these things. Why house gecko doesn't have a medicinal value? No, why house gecko is not been used as a medicinal thing? Because it is common, and that has been considered as poisonous. No, the big geckos have medicinal value. Small geckos doesn't have. That is wrong. No, so I always feel that people want to eat it. And just to you know, get away from that uh, blame, they just say, oh, there is some medicinal value. No medicinal value is there in any, any product of animals. Uh, this is a question from Satavisha. Hello, sir. Is cannibalism a rare kind of behavior in case of house lizards? As it seems, there are a few researches on it. So basically, cannibalism is been reported in uh, uh, quite a lot of house geckos. So generally, what happens? The large-bodied uh, house geckos prefer to feed on the small-bodied house geckos or their juveniles like that. But as you rightly said, it is not been properly documented. It must be happening quite regularly, but it is not been documented. That is the study which is you no. Know, so we see much of our understanding of anything related to lizards today in India. I always say that it is anecdotal. See, read any book. They will tell you that, oh, this lizard feeds on insect. Insects. What do you mean by insects? Insect is a tremendous group of arthropods. There are so many kind of insects. What kind of insect that lizard feeds? Is there any seasonality? Is there any particular season in that season? Are they only feed on beetles? Are they only feed on bugs? What do they feed on? Nothing is known. We just randomly say, oh, they feed on insects. How many times we have seen them feeding on insects? Very rarely. Are all lizards feed on insects? We don't know. So this is what is the problem. So all our understanding today, except the scientific name, all our understanding today is based on anecdotal observation. The observations which are done by a few people and it has been replicated by many people today. No? So the best example is all house geckos are poisonous. There is no poison gland in their skin. Their skin doesn't carry any poison. Their mouth doesn't have any poison gland. They don't, they don't have poison in any part of their body. But somebody said that it is poisonous, everybody saying that it is poisonous. It's like that. So it is wrong. So similarly, the, the food is like that. People say, oh, the feeds on uh, this and everybody follows that. So as I feel that you no, know, whatever you observe, start writing about it. So until we don't write it, it doesn't go. See, that scientific publication becomes a resource. And we have to publish it. Until then, it is a story. Anything you publish on Facebook is of no value. So the next question is from Rahul. Please comment on effective methods for permanently marking small lizards for population monitoring. For example, skins. So, see, uh, Rahul, this is a very interesting question. So, prior to marking them, what I would like to suggest to you is, please take all the due permissions from the forest department. Because they are the custodians. We have to take due permissions from the forest department. Now, after that, you know, marking methods are different for different groups. No, in agamids, people uh, put some beads on their neck or on their on the near their tail, and based on that, you know, they mark individual lizards. So there are small microchips you get. You put them uh, subdermal chips. You just put them under the skin. 
and then you can scan them. No, so skinks also is very difficult again because see, uh, uh, in frogs people do toe clipping and everything, but here it is not possible. No, it is it is not good for for lizard as well. So I think no uh, for skinks I feel that no that that subdermal thing is is a good good thing. Yeah. No, the see if you put some mark color below everything that that goes because these they lose their skin and with that everything goes. Uh, the next question is from Ayud. Hello, sir. I am interested in herpetology. Can you suggest a few good institutes for learning herpetology and to pursue a career? <laughs> Ayud, uh, okay. So, see, uh, pursuing a career in herpetology in India, I always say that it's not a good, it's not a good thing. That doesn't assure you a good job. It doesn't assure you a good salary. It doesn't assure you a very comfortable life. Because see, uh, wildlife in India is very, very uh, uh, glorious. See, wildlife is always glorious on National Geographic Discovery Channel. Where people who do wildlife, they are, they are not the real wildlifers. They are the presenters. The real wildlifers have a different life. For them, things are things are very different. So, as a as a career, I feel that you no know, herpetology has tremendous opportunities to do science. To ask questions and answer those questions, but bottom line is getting funds for doing that work is very tough. Unfortunately, we don't have any good organization where this kind uh, very pure herpetology is happening. So, uh, if you go to northeastern part of India, there is a Aranyak. There is one institute where uh, uh, some some amount of work is happening. Uh, Mizoram University, Dr. H. T. Lalan Sangha is there, who is working on. Uh, reptiles there. Then, if you come to uh, Wildlife Institute of India, uh, Abhijit Das is there. No, so it's like there are people who are distributed across India, working on different aspects of reptiles. But there is no uh, uh, strong uh, institute where you know, herpetology as a career is being taught. We are in process of developing something. We are requesting some people now to start herpetology as a, as a as a course. And uh, I don't know when it will happen. But soon it may happen. But at this stage, we don't have anything like that. Uh, the next question is from myself. Uh -huh. How vulnerable are these lizards to current climate change scenario? And what immediate conservation efforts need to be taken in order to preserve their diversity? Yeah, interestingly, this is, this is another very interesting question. Because see, uh, lizards are poikilothermic. No, they are, uh, they, they are at the mercy of surrounding temperature. Means, their life history is directly dependent on the temperature. And we we, we, we also discussed about uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, endemic diversity. No? And when we talk about endemic diversity, means these lizards are endemic in some interesting geographical reasons as well. Go to the Western Guards. No? So there are many lizards which are the high altitude species, like that uh, five or six new species, what Chaitanya described of the Rivido Gecko. They all are high altitude or mid altitude species. There's another species of a lizard which is endemic to the Western Ghats called uh, Salia. It's a genus of a lizard called Salia. Okay, that is also endemic to high altitude. So, if the temperature is rising, these lizards don't have any place to go up now. They are already at the top. They will. They will. They are going to go. There are studies which predicted that uh, uh, by 2080 more than 40% of lizards in the world will go extinct to climate change. So this has been a study, this is a study which has been proved and uh, they did the ground truthing and they, they, they predicted that these are the animals which will go extinct by this year. They went there and those species are already extinct. Means it is happening, the species are going, species are disappearing. Unfortunately, in a country like India, we really don't know how many species are there. Where do they live? What do they eat? Nothing is known. So, how are you going to do the conservation? So, I always feel that for conservation, let's start documenting. Let's start documenting whatever you can document for lizards in India. That is going to help uh, the conservation. No? <laughs> Thank you, sir. The next question is from Rohan. What are the various methods applied for identifying a new species? So, see, Rohan, as I told you, uh, we have to start with uh, morphology. Do a detailed morphological study. Get all the morphological characters, proper morphological characters. 
then do a proper phylogeny no use proper genes to uh, address that particular question then no you should have a proper sampling you should have a proper understanding of that particular group as i told you describing a new species is not difficult no what people do they they they, they, they just get one species get some few characters and they say oh this character is different and they will describe it that may not be the right way to describe a species we should have we should follow the integrated approach we should have a very you know uh, 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 nice understanding of their phylogeny proper understanding of their bio everything once you put everything together your results become more robust you no know? then you can describe a species quite properly means and see many people feel that if i have dna i don't have to worry about morphology i don't have to worry about taxonomy nothing like that taxonomy phylogeny biogeography everything everything has to work together once you put everything together in a proper way your results are more robust so the next question is from arijit as it is known that evolution gives rise to polymorphic nature of species in india there are also certain polymorphic species of reptiles such as malabar pivot uh, malabar yeah. pit viper sir i want to know that even though they are really and they are restricted only at a small geographical location what environmental or microhabitat cues gives rise to their polymorphism see uh, uh, arijit another very interesting question very good question see polymorphism i always say that evolution is like demand and supply no i i need something and then i get it why that particular species is polymorphic because that species want to be like that so you know, this species is arboreal lives on the trees very rarely come on the ground they don't go out for hunting their prey they wait and hunt for their prey and to do all these things they should be cryptic means nobody should see them they should be merging with the surrounding and in doing so if they have a single color then it will become difficult for them to merge with their surrounding and if they have multiple colors that mul multiple color is going to help them to perfectly blend with the surrounding if they are in green region uh, predominantly green color is going to help them if they are in a different region a uh, different color is going to help them so this polymorphism is a derivative of that demand basically you no know, of camouflaging so this is what i i personally feel but unfortunately believe me this is what is a speculation this whatever i'm talking is a hypothesis is not the thesis okay this is just a hypothesis and this is proof for all the things in india we know that malbar pit viper is polymorphic but why it is polymorphic nobody knows is this polymorphism is there in the juveniles we don't know i have seen maybe hundreds of juveniles of malbar pit viper but they all look alike means that polymorphism is happening in their adult condition they are changing the colors in the adult condition so why do they do that is a question see this is a amazing question what that need to be answered and today anything all the answers except a few what i discussed in in some of the papers which we discussed now except those much of the answers are hypothesis they are not they are not facts okay we are we are using some hypothesis based on studies conducted somewhere else and we are saying that oh it should be like that that is not that may not be the reality the next question is from gora during systematics a large number of species are sacrificed or killed whose number are already scanty scanty so don't you think you uh, doing systematics we are actually doing more harm to the species can't we focus either on the photographic or ecological separation or rather focus on the species habitat conservation so gaurav to answer your question salim ali is a is the biggest poacher there do you know how many birds he killed no he killed those birds and because of that people wrote books because of that we are doing identification today because of that our understanding of birds is robust today if 
he would have thinking like oh i am not killing this today it would have been difficult for us to distinguish species see understanding biodiversity is very very essential very important because we are sharing our resources with them and without that how are you going to say that oh this habitat is unique this habitat is important to conserve you are saying that we need to conserve the habitat suppose you go to the forest department or somebody and you say that i want to conserve this forest the first question they will ask you why you want to conserve it you can't say though it's a very good habitat what do you mean by very good habitat i need to tell them that no i have these many species of lizards here these many species of birds here out of that these many species are endemic so that adds to the value what is biodiversity hotspot biodiversity hotspot indicates that so many species are there and out of that no only 30% are doing well 70% are in problems for a large number of endemic diversity everything is going to help me to evaluate that particular place now when it comes to lizards you are saying that no people are killing so many lizards how can you say that this they are scanty what is your hypothesis to say that their population is less we don't know we really don't know how many how, what is their number and out of that if i'm if i'm picking 5 10 20 individuals that is not going to change anything so one at one point of time somebody told me like there was a debate happening they said like only 20 individuals of that lizards are left so what are you going to do i said i will kill all of them because 20 is not a viable population that species is technically extinct it is already dead no 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 you can keep them in the captivity we can bring them back you no know, like bringing cheetah back to india is it feasible is it needed it's already gone so we don't have to see like for vultures we have to worry because their population has crashed in 20 years their captive breeding is needed and to do the captive breeding i should know which vultures are dying i should know i should kill few vultures in the beginning and say oh these are the different species of vultures and out of that i need to conserve these to prioritize conservation i need to document the biodiversity and in that please don't use word killed say sacrifice because sacrifice is very important the people who kill these animals they deposit those specimens in the museums and in those museums those specimens will remain as a resource for ages for thousands and thousands of years until that museum is alive those specimens will be there once we have a sound understanding like for that matter now do we need to king, kill king cobra no we don't need to kill it but believe me there is a study which happened which proved that king cobra is not one species i am talking about one of the largest venomous snakes in the world which we considered as one species today it is not one species and the recent studies prove that it is not one species think of lizards we have to do some sacrifice otherwise how are you going to say that this landscape is important no habitat conservation is only possible when we have a sound understanding of what biodiversity is there without that you can't do conservation Uh, so we have only four more questions would you like to continue or should we mail them to you no i think we'll just finish them like if there are four okay, just sir. yeah uh, so the next question is from swastik why is there not much of behavioral or ecological study on reptiles so swastik do you like house lizard do you like snake do you like any of the uh, uh skinks or anything no unfortunately imagine which are the groups which are properly studied in 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 animal world now to that matter i'll tell you birds in birds the birds which are which looks cute like do we know anything about crows house crow we don't know much about house crows okay what is happening to them we don't know because that is black in color that that is not very attractive so like that what i mean is the species which are charismatic our attention goes towards them like everybody wants to you know do research on tigers 
I think tiger is one species. And I'm talking about something around 285 species of lizards. No? So I think uh, our, as I think if you think of my presentation at the end, I said like get mesmerized by them. Until you don't get mesmerized by them, I think uh, we can't do anything. See, uh, academic research is different. Many people do academic research because they want to do their PhD. They want, they have some project, they want to finish it. Okay, so that gives you some insight. That is not the real insight. The people who spend their entire lifetime looking at those groups and trying to answer questions. I think for that, we need dedicated attention, dedicated efforts. I, and I made it very clear in the beginning that there is no money. But all the herpetologists I know today, they all are struggling. But they are not leaving this field because they got mesmerized. They got attached to it. Like that, you know, if you, the moment you decide that, no, I have to do this. See, the main problem is <clears throat> people feel that lizards are not good. That is one of the reasons for their negligence. People don't come to this field because of that. So that's what I told you. you know, it's like our brain is filled with unwanted files. We need to shift, delete those files. And the moment we shift, delete those files, I think there will be a positive change. Yeah. So the next question is from Raja. How to conserve urban lizards in an effective way? So uh, spread awareness. Nowadays, uh, in the pest control, lizard is one of the components. No? Like people say that uh, we, we'll, we'll, we will remove lizard from your house and we will put a pesticide inside. That means <laughs> there is a biological pest control agent which is there in your house, which is controlling the insect population. We, we are removing that and putting pesticide there, which is detrimental to us, which is really bad for us. Lizards are not. So I think the, we have to see Rajaji, what we have to do is talk good about them. Always go and tell people that lizards are not dangerous, snakes are not dangerous. I think awareness is something which is really needed. And the moment people believe that, yes, we need these things, and then conservation will start from there. When people start allowing lizards in their house, that's what is the conservation for lizards in urban areas. Uh, there's another question from Venkatesh. Sir, is there any taxonomical database for reptiles? OK, I'm just sending the link here. Uh, I'm sending the name here, but EMBL reptile database. I typed it there. There's something called EMBL Reptile Database, and that is one of the well uh, maintained database, very good database. And this is a global database, basically. No? Uh, the last question from uh, Sharavanan uh, Do lizards have territory? If so, how do they establish it? So, Sharavanan, again, this is a very, 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 very interesting naturalistry related question. Now, the lizards, what we know today, we say that they are territorial. Okay. And probably they must be having some scent markings, which they use you know, uh, uh, to mark their territory, basically, like geckos, to that matter, have some, some glands on their thighs. And they, they apply those glands you know, to show their presence. And uh, like monitor, I, and there are many lizards which are not territorial as such. Basically, you know, they, they, they have a very large area where they live, like monitor lizards are large body lizards. And, uh, and like common garden lizard, to that matter, is also, you know, doesn't have a territory, but it lives in that. But, but what happens during the breeding season, when two males come together, they start fighting. So that is a very, uh, it's not a typical territorial fight, but it is a fight for females and such. But when it comes to Indian lizards, we really don't know. Thank you, sir, for clearing all our queries. Uh, I think now we have reached the end of the Q&A session. If the participants have any more queries, please feel free to mail us, and we, may, uh, we will maybe pass them on to sir. You can also find the link to our YouTube channel and our email address in the chat box. At last, I would like to thank Varad, sir, for this wonderful talk. I would like to thank the faculty coordinator Professor Devi Prasad for being with us. I extend my sincere thanks to all the faculty members of the department for joining us. And I would like to thank the audience for their interest and patience throughout the meet. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, at last, I would like to remind all the participants to fill up the feedback, feedback forms for the certificates. Thank you. Thank you.